So at this point, we are looking at examples of finite state machines. So what we've covered so far is we've looked at this whole three process model for designing a finite state machine. And whenever you have a generic finite state machine, that's always what you do. You have one process for the state memory, one for the next state logic, and one for the output logic, and you always do it the exact same way. You can do it, take advantage of a lot of copy and paste with finite state machine designs in VHDL, but the best way to learn it is through examples. So let's do an example of a serial bit sequence detector. And you may recall this one from chapter seven. This was one that you actually did by hand. And what we're gonna do here is imagine that you have a system that has a synchronous single bit sequence coming into it. And what we'll do is we'll call the input DN. So what's gonna happen is that you're just gonna see a ones and zeros, ones and zeros come in, <clears throat> and they're all synchronous to the clock. So as soon as you come out of reset, that is t equals zero, and from then on out, you're gonna see three bit packets. So, you, and the state machine has to track. Is this bit zero, bit one, bit two, start over. Bit zero, bit one, bit two, start over. It's never out of sequence, so it always sees those three bits as packets. In order to do that, you have to have a finite state machine because somebody has to keep track of which bit is coming in in the packet. Is it the first bit, second bit, or the zeroth bit? Okay, so that's why you need a finite state machine. Now, <clears throat> what we'll do in this one is let's have it assert a output signal called error whenever it sees a code 111. Okay, so the idea of this is that you're transmitting three bit packets of data and everything, you know, zeros and ones, and it's just great and everything's awesome. Except that if there's ever a situation where whoever's transfer, transferring you the information has a problem, it'll send three ones in a row to indicate that there's an error. Your finite state machine will just sit there and count bits one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then if it ever sees that, that code one, 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 it will then assert an output signal and some other system will notice and you will do something. Okay, so the first thing you, you start off with is the state diagram, okay? And you do this even when you're doing it in VHDL because this is your algorithmic design. Whether or not you implement this with pen and paper or in discrete parts or in HDL is regardless. You almost always do a finite uh, state diagram. So here's what we're gonna do. We are going to have a start state and what we're gonna do is we need a path of three states to track the three incoming bits. So we're basically gonna be like bit zero, bit one, bit two, bit zero, bit one, bit two, bit zero, bit one, bit two. And we will repeat through this state diagram over and over. Then what we'll do is we will have a path through the state machine or the state diagram that will be traversed if you start getting ones. So if you get a one, 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 it will go through three particular states. And if you ever get through those three states, you will then assert the output ERR signal and then that will indicate an error, okay? But what the state machine has to do is it has to also keep track of three bits whether or not you get 111 or whether or not you get 001, okay? So whether you get a valid code or the error code, you still have to keep track. And also what's of interest, of interest is that if you start getting ones, so if you get a 110, for the first two ones that you receive, it's going through the path that will indicate an error, but then it jumps out of that path on the last bit. So you kind of have to think about all the possible combinations of bits that come into this. So if you think about it, we're gonna start in a start state and we will literally call this start. Then you have two options. You either get a zero or a one. If you get a one, we're gonna go to a state, which I made up, state name, called D0 is a one. So it's D0 underscore is underscore one. If you don't get that, you'll go to a state called D0 not one. Okay, somewhat descriptive. <clears throat> now, if you think about it, if you got a one, you are gonna come down this path, and this is the path that would be when you might see an error. So after you get into this state right here, if you get another one, you are gonna get, you are gonna go to a different state called D1 is one. And then if you get to this state and you get a one, you will assert the output ERR, and you will then return to start. So that's the way that the bits come in. So it's basically like one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, if you get any other code, such as something that starts with a zero, you will come down to this path. And once you're in this path, it doesn't matter what the rest of the bits are, okay? If you get a zero and then a one, 
you don't really care. You know that you just want to go down this path right here because this represents the path for all other sequences. If you happen to get like a 100, zero, zero, what you would do is you would start down this air path, but then you would need to be able to jump over into the non-air path so you can keep counting bits, but you want to make sure that when you're in this situation, you're on the non-air path, you're going to not assert the output. Okay? Okay. Now, the way that you draw the state diagram is that in this situation, you're only going to write down when error is asserted, and you assume anywhere else error is equal to a zero. So that's why right here, that's why you only see it right there. Okay? Okay. Now, you probably are curious way back in the day when you did this with pen and paper how you synthesized it. Well, if you remember, the first thing you did is you took all your states, your state diagram, and you put it in a state transition table where you listed all the current states, all the next states, and all the inputs and the associated transitions between them, and then, of course, the output. Then what you had to do is by pen and paper, you actually went through and you created the output logic for the, for the next state. So you had this next state you know, k-maps that would actually create the combinational logic circuit that would produce these next state bits. Okay? And then at the end, you also created output logic using a k-map from that same table that would produce the logic for when to assert ERR. And in the end, it ended up being a circuit like this. This is important because it's the three block model of a finite state machine. Well, we model that in VHDL using a three process model. To model the D flip-flops in my finite state machine, I'm going to have a process that is going to be the state memory. Okay? And I write it right here, but I didn't really need to because it's right there. So we're going to use a process to do that. And then all of the combinational logic that you use to create the next state codes, that's going to be a process. And then you're going to have another process, a third process, which models your output logic. The reason you need three different processes is because they are triggered off of different signals and they produce different outputs. That's the way you think about it. A process is going to be a circuit. Okay, so life is good. Let's go ahead and see <clears throat> what happens if we try to model this. So I have, we'll keep that puppy over there so that we can see it. I have a test bench to stimulate this particular sequence detector. And so I got my model sim up here. I've already started a pro uh, project. And let's go through the state machine or the uh, test bench and see what we're going to do. So we come in here. We're going to call it seek detect, detect TB. And I'm going to go ahead and just define the ports for the circuit itself. Now, when I look at this, what I want to do is I'm going to call this system SEQ underscore DET. Okay? And I am going to have a clock and a reset. Finite state machines are synchronous machines. That means you always have a clock, you always have a reset. Okay? Then you are going to have one input signal, which is going to be called DN, and we're going to have one output called ERR. Okay? All right, so we instantiate that thing up. I'm going to have a process in my test bench, which will create the reset condition. So like in all the examples before, we'll, keep, we'll come out, we'll start the simulation in reset, and then we'll come out of reset like a half clock later. That way, the, the second rising edge of clock will be when you start doing something. And, or actually, in this situation, the first rising edge, sorry. We're going to have a process for the clock, which is going to basically go low for 10 nanoseconds, high for 10 nanoseconds. That's going to be a 20 nanosecond clock period, which is 50 megahertz. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have this DN stimulus. This is where we're going to put in the three-bit sequence. So the first one we'll do is 100. Zero, zero, and what we'll do is the first wait statement is 10 nanoseconds to get everything synced up because I had that reset thing there. And we'll see that in the simulation. And then from then on out, we can put in three bit codes. So what I have already here is I already have the air condition. But let's put one in there that's not the air condition. So let's put like 110. So we'll put three data packets into this thing. 100, 111, and then 110. And let's watch the states traverse. OK, so I'm ready to go. And I'm going to fire up my design. So let's go add to project, new file. And I'm going to call this puppy seek det for sequence detect. And now I'm ready to rock and roll. And I'm going to try to take advantage of as much copy and pasting as possible. First of all, the library and package, we're going to use standard Logic 1164. 
probably will never have to type this in ever again because you have it so many places. So I start off by putting that package in there. Now I want to get the entity. But you know what? I have a test bench which already defined exactly the, the name of my entity and the port descriptions. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that from my sequence detector test bench. And I'll pop that down there. And all I do is I go entity seek debt is, I got all my ports, and then I go end entity. Okay? All right, life is good. And now what we're going to do is we'll go down into the architecture <clears throat> and we're going to do the following. Wait a minute. We want this. We'll do the black and white puppy right there. A lot of puppies today. Okay, so now what we're going to do is let us go down and start the architecture. And I do it right here. Architecture. Seek debt arc of seek debt is. <laughs> Begin and architecture. And let's wake up the compiler. Okay. So I'm going to compile all. Okay, compiler's awake. Everybody is compiled. Now it's time to add some functionality. The first thing that I want to do is I am going to create my user-defined enumerated states. Okay, I'm going to create a new data type called state type, and I'm going to enumerate all the values it can take on. So the way that you do that is you come up before the begin, begin statement, you are going to declare a new type. Then we are going to give it a name and I always I always call it state type and you'll notice also whenever you go look at any reference VHDL everybody else does too. So this is kind of the agreed upon name for this thing. And then what I'm going to do is I want to list out all possible values that this can take on. This is going to be these names right here. Start, D0 is 1, all that sort of stuff. So I'm just going to pop these in there. So I'm going to go start, D0 is one. I'll copy that because that's kind of a popular way to do it. And then I'll do D one is one. And then I'll do a D zero, not one. And then I'll do a D one, not one. Okay. Now I do the following. I've created my states. I've created this new type. I'm going to now create a new signal or I'm going to declare a new signal. And I'm going to actually do two of them. One of them is going to be current state. Another one's going to be next state. And I'm going to give them the type state type. Boom. Done. I have just now declared my states. I'm going to let the synthesizer worry about assigning the codes for me. This will allow me to get into the simulation and actually see these states cruise along. All right. Are you ready? We need to create three processes. First one will be state memory. So I'm going to give it a name, state memory. And I'm going to make this a process. And I ask you the following. What are the two signals that trigger the state memory process? Always and forever, clock and reset. That is it. In fact, you'll probably never write this ever again because you copy and paste it so much into all your finite state machines that it's just common. All right, let's begin this puppy up. And what I want to do now, the system. Reset. It blows everybody else away. It is asynchronous. So I actually say if <laughs> reset is equal to zero, then the big question for you is this. Who is the output that I'm assigning to within the state memory? If you think about the block diagram for this, here is the actual circuit that would be synthesized. This is state memory. Who is getting assigned? Who, who am I assigning to? The current state. That's the state memory drives the current state. Sometimes it will use the next state code to assign to it. Sometimes it will assign it a default reset code. Okay. All right. Well, that's fine. Let's see what happens. I'm going to say if reset is equal to zero, then we are going to assign current state the start, start state. Okay? We will just go right to start, and that'll be great. Then what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to say else if I'm going to handle the other situation in this process, which is a rising edge of a clock. Now you can do it a couple different ways. You can do clock tick event and clock equals one, or you can use the rising edge function. What do you want to do? I agree. Rising edge of clock. And I put that like that. And then I say then, and now what do I do when I get a rising edge of a clock and I'm not in reset? I assign current state, what? Next state. And that's it. In all other situations, I do nothing. I make no assignments to current state. So how do you model nothing? Nothing. You model holding the past value by not making a signal assignment. So all you do is and if, boom, 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 done. All right, let's make sure that there's no uh, syntax errors on that. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. All right. <laughs> now what would you like to do? Next state logic? Absolutely. OK, now this is going to be a big one because we have to model all these different state transitions. But we'll, do, we'll take advantage of copy and paste. So I'm going to come along, and I'm going to call this process next state logic. And I'm going to say process. The key question for this process is, what is in the sensitivity list? It is combinational logic, meaning it does not look at clock and reset. So it looks at what? It always looks at the current state, and it always looks at any inputs you have. Because we are going to decide where to go for the next state. That means I need to know what the current state is. Okay? And when we, so that's the inputs. It's current state and any inputs that we have. Do you remember what the inputs are? Well, it was D in. So the name we came up with was D I N. Now, who are we assigning to? This process needs to assign to something. If I go back and look at what will be synthesized, this is next state logic. What is it assigning to? Next state. So the output of this process is next state. OK, life is good. So I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to say begin. Oh, geez, i got to list out all of these current states and then make a decision based upon dn. So this is going to take forever. Should we use an if-then statement? Should we use a case statement? Should we use both? I agree. Case. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at current state. Okay. So I say case current state is. Then I come down here and I'm going to start off and I'm going to say when. And I start with my first state, which is start. So what I need to do at this point is when I'm sitting in start, I need to look at DN and make a decision about where to go next. So the syntax that I use is in a case statement. I do this <clears throat> syntax right there. And I'm going to actually put in here an if-then statement. So if I'm in current state, if <clears throat> dn is equal to a 1, then where am I going? Next state gets assigned d0 is 1. OK, all right. So I'm going to go to d0 is 1. Where else, where, should, where would I go otherwise? If it's not a 1, I would go this way, right? So I would go to otherwise d0, not 1. So otherwise, I'm heading to next state is d0, not 1. OK, so I got my if, else, and if. And I feel pretty good. You feel good? Why not? Now you're like, man, this is way too much typing. Way too much typing. Should we start doing some copy and pasting? Yeah, why not? So let's take a look at this guy right here. So I'm going to go down, and I'm going to go to this next state, which I'm going to look at. And let's do this one right here. Let's, let's follow the path of when it's getting the error code. Okay. So now I'm going to be sitting in the state where I've got, I'm in D0 is 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, if dn is a 1, I'm going to go to the state d1 is 1. So I come over here and I say, OK, if dn is a 1, the next state is d1 is a 1. OK. Otherwise, I come over here and say 
dn is a zero, I'm going to d1, not a one. Okay, that makes sense. Then I end that. And now what I'm gonna do is think about something, <clears throat> okay? Let us do the following. Let's model this state right here. I mean, D1 is a one. Where am I going next? Start. Doesn't matter what DN is, is it? That means I don't even need an if then statement. I can just do when D1 is a one, I'm just gonna head on back. I'm just gonna say next state gets start. And guess what else? Check this out. Now I, that's the error path. Now let's go back and do this state. We only got two states to go. We only we got D0, not 1. If I'm in D0, not 1, where am I going? D1 is not 1, no matter what the input is. So that means I can come over here, and I can do something like this. When I am in D0 is not a 1, that state right there, no matter what, the next state is going to be D1, not 1. So that now has modeled this state right here. I'm always going to D1 is not 1. I only got one state left, so let's pop that one in there. So I got to do this last one. So I say if I'm in D1 is not a 1, where am I going? Start. I already got it. Okay. We always do an others clause just to be safe. So I'm going to slap down here a when others, where should we go? When it, if it ever gets messed up, where do you want to go? Always go back to the reset state. Okay. If this ever happens, you're in trouble, but it's always good to put it in there. Okay. So there's my next state logic. I'm going to go ahead and say end case, and then I'm going to end my process. Did I already do it? Not even close. So let's do this. I'm going to go end process. And now that was a lot of typing. So let's compile this and make sure it looks okay. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and say compile selected. <laughs> All right. Does anybody see it? I'm going to double click. Illegal statement start line 43. <laughs> you don't just type start for no reason. You say next date get start. That makes way more sense. Save it. Compile selected. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Are you ready to model the last state? The last process. The last process is going to be the output logic. What is the output logic sensitive to? We're going to use a process. What are the inputs in the sensitivity list? What triggers this? Always current state. If it's not looking at current state, it's not part of the circuit. Okay, so it always looks at current state. And then it may or may not look at the input. In this situation, we absolutely look at the input. So we need current state and DN in our sensitivity list. Okay, all righty. So let's do that. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to put my third process. So I'm going to come down here, put a little comment there. Boom, come down here. I'm going to say next, not even close, output logic process sensitive to current state and DN. And then I'm going to begin the process. Let's go ahead and end the process. And now let's start. I ask you a following question. I need to list out each and every state. So I'm going to say case, current state. And then I say is. Could I ask you a question? When is the only time that we will ever assert ERR? It's when current state is D1 is 1 and input DN is 1. So if I do a case statement and I say case, current state, I can say that when D1 is 1, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say if DN is equal to a 1, then the output ERR, which is who I'm assigning to, gets a 1. Then I end that if statement because that's all I'm doing right there. Or excuse me, let's do an else. If you're in that state and you don't get DN as a 1, you got to do this. Huh. 
And then I do end if. Ah, end if. <laughs> and now, in all other situations, ERR is a zero. How would you like to handle it? You want to list them all out? What's a faster way? When others, no matter what else happens, let's just go ahead and say ERR gets a zero done. Okay, let's see if the compiler liked any of that. And I gotta end my case statement and then we'll simulate this and see if it worked. So I'm gonna go end case, boom, boom, and everything looks okay. So I got my end pro end this and end everything. End case, end process, end architecture. Let's compile that a puppy. Oh! All right, here's the moment of truth. Let's simulate this thing. So I'm gonna go into, into library. I'm gonna bring in the test bench. I load this guy up. <clears throat> it's gonna flicker a little bit. Just let it flicker. Don't need to rush it. All right, now I'm gonna come over here. And this is, this is key. I have a waveform and I wanna add signals to it. But I wanna add wave signals in design because I wanna see the current state and next state signals. If I, don't lo if I load from the region, that does the test bench level and you can't see those internal signals. So I do design and that gives me everything below and above. I can nuke the upper ones because they're redundant. And now let's see what happens. So this should run what? Let's go like 100 nanoseconds. Let's see what happens. Okay. Oh, it's moving, it's moving. All right, it's moving. So let's come in here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna nuke next state too to make this a little easier. We come in and we get a reset and it goes to the start state. <clears throat> here is the end. You start off and it is a one. So you got D zero is a one. Then you got, it's a zero. So I went to D one is not a one. And then it went back to start and it did not assert ERR. It's like, okay, that's cool. Let's see what the next sequence was. Oh baby, look at DN. It was a one, one, one. And look at what happened. You went from start to D0 is a one, D1 is a one, and right there you asserted ERR. Now let's look at the last pattern, which was when we came in and we did like a 110. So this now went start, D0 is a one, D1 is a one, but you went back to start and you did not assert ERR. You see that? We have now created the state machine that does exactly what we want it. All right, so that is the sequence detector example.